Deep right field. Down the line it goes. Got Castellanos it. is out of room. It's out of Runner goes. 3 2 pitch hit down the line. Is it there? It is a fair ball into the corner. Off and running. Chew. Yu Chang around third. He's going to score easily. And in the second. Hit hard. Hit deep. Up and out. Goes a man Rosario. And there's a fly ball. Left field. It's deep. It's up. It's gone to the porch. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Guardians of the CLE podcast. I am your host, Max Goldstein, joined as always by my co-host, Mel Kirby. And look, Guardians seem to be picking it up a little bit. Winners of seven out of their last 10, um, going four and two, four wins out of their last six against Kansas City, Baltimore, and Texas since our last recorded episode. But Mel, it seems to be the consistency in that pitching. I mean, it, we thought it was going to be the reason um, for our success this year, but the offense has been doing their part to keep us in games. But now it seems to be that switch. Like, what, what's, what's the difference that you're seeing this past week as opposed to, you know, the whole last month of May? Yeah, I really think, and, you know, we can go back to before the season, and I think most people thought our starting rotation was like the one sure thing on this team. Like, we were guaranteed, mm-hmm. almost guaranteed to get success out of, those five guys, but you know, it's been the bullpen and it's been the offense up and down for most of the year. The rotation struggled a little bit, but I think the same with the rest of the team. I think all these rainouts, like it's hard for these guys to get rolling their bullpens, you know, are probably getting rained out and it's hard for them to get in this, you know, consistent flow. We were just talking about all these rainouts at home before we hopped on here, but, you know, we're looking at the same situation tonight, but, you know, I think it starts at the top, you know, talking about the rotation with Shane Bieber. So his last three starts, he's went seven innings in each of them. He struck out 26 and walked only four, and he's only allowed six total runs throughout that whole stretch. And I think that's big because, you know, with Shane Bieber, we've been saying most of the season so far that his velocity is down. Is he still hurt? Is he rebounding from that shoulder still? But I think it's important to remember just how much time he missed with that shoulder injury last year. Then they had the shortened spring. And I think he's really finally just starting to get back in the groove. And, you know, I think the success of this rotation kind of starts with him. He's You want him to be that that, you know, sure guy that, you know, if you got a little bit of a losing streak going, you want to throw your ace out there and get you back in the win column. And I think he's really starting to show that over these last few starts. Yeah. It's been really exciting watching Shane just go out there and deal. Mind you, I think his last three starts came against um, what he, he's got one coming up tonight against Texas. He faced ball. He faced Baltimore. Um, what did he beat the, uh, he beat the, the Royals and was the last one, maybe the, the A's or. I'm forgetting, but either way, it's nice to see him sort of find that consistency. I think earlier on in the season, he was struggling to find the zone a little bit. And, you know, once he was finding that struggle and, and, and what, I mean, excuse me, once teams were finding that struggle in him, he was starting to try and paint the corners and stuff like that. He was getting, putting guys on with walks and, you know, throwing easy grooving fastballs down the plate and it just wasn't working out for him, but three straight starts with seven innings. And like you were mentioning, he had 26 strikeouts over that span. So he's right up around nine strikeouts per, per start here. And, and it's sort of back to same old Shane Bieber. So finding that consistency, that tone setter you were mentioning is, is very, very key for this team's success. And, you know, we're certainly glad to see it, but another guy that has been somewhat consistent, had a bit of a rough outing his last time out is Tristan McKenzie. Um, he's arguably been the best starter for the guardians this year, um, in the early set of the season, but in the month of May, he had a 217 ERA coupled with 28 strikeouts and only seven walks. Like I was saying, you know, he started a couple nights ago and got knocked around a little bit, but that, you know, I, I don't see that continuing. And I just kind of wanted to hear your, your thoughts on how Tristan McKenzie, that, that maturity we're seeing this season, as opposed to, you know, the last couple that he's been with the franchise, it's, it's, it's just really refreshing to see. Yeah, I think the stuff has never been the issue with Tristan McKenzie, right? He's got that mid-90s fastball. His pitches play off each other well. He knows how to use them. It's always been a mental struggle with Tristan. Like, he walks a guy and and he would implode from there. 
right? And I think this year he's just found that balance of not getting too high, not getting too low. He's just a, he's almost taken a page out of Aaron Savali's book. Like he's just real, like cool, calm and collected out there on the mound, which is what, what you want to see from that guy when he's toeing the rubber. Um, but, you know, you mentioned he struggled his last time out and he still managed to go seven innings. I was going to say, yeah. Which I think that right there just is a perfect example of that maturity you're talking about with Tristan. You know, the ball was flying out of Camden Yards, which we'll talk about a little more later. You know, he wasn't the the Baltimore starter was getting knocked around just as bad. Guys were hitting him on the on the Utah Street, and he didn't let that get to him though. He didn't implode. He he had damage control. You know, Cal Quantrill's really good at that. You know, he gets guys on base. He may have a rough inning, but he limits the damage. And if Tristan can continue, and I saw people flipping out about Tristan's one bad start, and I'm okay. I'm trying to tell these people like. Since he came into the league, I think in what, 2018, he has the lowest opponent batting average in the majors throughout that time span. I mean, this kid is good. I mean, it's not just a fluke. Like this kid's got good stuff and it's going to play and he doesn't have to be the ace of this staff moving forward. But if he can be a solid three, four starter when guys like Daniel Espino and Gavin Williams, I mean, this rotation is going to be stacked. And yeah. I think he's a guy you want to try to lock up, you know, try to get some more controllable years, you know, extend them through his arb years. He might be a good candidate for that if he can keep pitching like this moving forward. Oh, absolutely. Look, he he's still super young. He's been super, super consistent throughout his career. It was really just more about finding that start after the next sort of consistency for him, which he, I believe he found this year. And he ran into a little bit of a bump against Baltimore. And like you were saying, still pitch seven innings. That's guys, that's a, that's a quality start in the major leagues. Right. But, you know, giving up seven hits, five runs here and there. Um, you know, I think, I think the, the killer in that one was, uh, was it a two or three run Homer that, that put us down early. I think that's what it was, but just for him to battle, get through those innings, get through the pitches he was supposed to get to really just, just refreshing in my mind, but Cal Quantrill, you were just mentioning, um, he picked up a win this week against the Rangers and his last start was against Kansas city. So there have been two straight starts where where we won with him on the bump and he's been our tough luck starter this year, right? Really not getting that much uh, run support, but in the last two, we put up six and eight. So hopefully that just begins a theme for us moving forward. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, yeah, basically he had no, no run support this year. Um, and he's only given up four plus runs once this season. And I believe that that, um, you know, happened a cu- couple of weeks back. But in, in May, he, he really has just gone at least six innings in all of his starts. And, and that's that's what you sign up for. Right. When, when you're pitching for the Guardians and this Cleveland franchise, you want guys that can go long innings, productive, efficient work. And that's, you know, from the three guys we've mentioned so far today, Beaver, Tristan, and Cal Quantrill, they're, they're hitting their marks. And, and we're about to get into Zach Plesak as well. We'll talk about him soon. But Tristan, uh, excuse me, Cal Quantrill, you know, n- nothing really more to say about this guy. He, he's only doing what he's required of. And, and I, I just can't get enough of, you know, watching him on the bump. I, I see us, you know, winning any game that, that he's on there for. Yeah, he'll always give you a chance to win. Like you said, he's been the guy along with Plesak who hasn't got any run support all year. He's been that tough luck starter, but he always gives us a chance to win the game. And I think that's the biggest thing with him. His command has been an issue um, early on this season. You know, he's had multiple walks and almost all of his starts, I believe. But he's starting to get that under control a little bit. And it's just what's so impressive about him is that damage control I mentioned earlier, you know, he's got a lot of stressful innings with, with traffic on the bases. And how many times have we seen him with two guys on bases loaded one out, right. And he he gets out of the inning without allowing a run and he's just jacked up leaving them heading back to the dugout after the inning. And like, that's, he's gritty. Like, I love the grit that Cal Quantrill pitches with, no matter what the offense is doing, he does his job. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, he's, he's, he's hitting on all cylinders, honestly. I mean, his velocity is there. The innings are there. 
it's just really more about, you know, giving him some run support. Uh, like I was saying, you know, we, we put up eight against Kansas City, but I think he, he was pulled already in the sixth inning. So at that point, I think he had his highest total amount of five runs. And then obviously we followed it up, um, you know, the other day against Texas. But it's really just more about this team scoring runs for some of these guys. We're, we're just about to get into it. Zach Plesak, right? Another guy that historically, as part of our team, just hasn't had that run support. But Zach Plesak is, you know, he, he's having an up and down year. He's, he's given up nine home runs in his last 10 starts. He's got a 310 ERA at home compared to a 752 ERA on the road. And unfortunately for Plesak, you know, that, that struggle to, to get home games this season, we've, we've been talking about it, those rain delays. I'm sure he's been slat, slat, slated for a couple of them, and it's just it, – it's, it's been a little frustrating for him. But he, he did have a, a good start on, um, on Saturday against the Orioles, right? We go in and um, we, we win – or, excuse me, we Sunday, lose Friday night's contest. Oh, was it was it Sunday? Sunday? Sunday, Sunday, excuse me. So – I was saying we, we go in, um, McKenzie loses that game on, on Saturday. And then for Zach Lysak against the Orioles, who a team we should be beating, does his job. And um, I'm just pulling it up here. He went. Um, he had the best start in the majors on Sunday, actually. He went six innings, gave up two runs and struck out eight. And right. like across baseball, he had the best start in all of baseball. And just talking about that Sunday game, that's a game we thought, man, Plesak's going to get a ton of runs finally because Jimenez had that first inning three-run homer. And the offense didn't do anything else the whole rest of the game. But luckily, you know, Plesak was on point, which honestly, we talk about it a lot on this podcast. It's really good to see him start to have some success because the issue with him all year has been he throws batting practice at times. He's not fooling guys. You know, the the exit velo coming off the bats, even if they're outs, they're loud outs and they've been loud outs all year. And I think starting with that San Francisco start about a month ago, maybe it was even in L.A., those balls started to leave the park. And that's Mm -hmm. when we started to see the damage that these home runs were starting to create for him. Um, For him, luckily, it's just keeping guys off the bases. If you are going to give up those home runs. It, just make them solo shots, limit that damage a little bit. But again, I, I really think um, police that could be a guy they look at at the deadline to sweeten a deal because remember this, I tell people all the time, this season's all about playing these kids, right? At some point you're going to have to get a look at guys like Cody Morris when he comes off the injured list, Connor Pilkington should probably stay in the rotation, Peyton Battenfield, Logan T. Allen is just mowing guys down at Akron. He'll be promoted to Columbus soon. So there's guys that, you know, more 40 man roster decisions are coming this off season. And he could be a guy, you know, for a team like the twins, not that they'd trade in the division, but you know, teams that are in first place that need some pitching help. He could be a really good back end arm for them, or maybe even a long guy out of the bullpen. I've always said, I think Plesak could be a guy that could find a ton of success in the bullpen, like an Eli Morgan, you know, we're seeing this year. I don't think police acts a loss cause at all. And I love seeing him find some success, not just because it boosts his value, but because he's helping us win games as we saw on Sunday. Right. Right. And and I think he's, he's slated for Friday night. I I still think it's to be determined who's going to be starting, but it should be him Friday night against Oakland. Another very winnable game and it's another game at home which uh he fares better at right he likes playing at progressive field as opposed to you know traveling on the road yeah those splits are days. wild mm-hmm. those exactly. era splits yeah and just just for the listeners again at home he's got a 310 era and on the road it's 752 so it's nearly he's it's nearly double when we're traveling, but just to, just to move on to some other pitchers within our staff here, Savali um, has been moved on to the injury list after struggling most of the season. His last start was against Detroit. It was promising, but when it came to, you know, um, when it just came down to it, he, he had to find the injury list there. There wasn't something wasn't right with him, but Connor Pilkington has filled in for Savali. And although he had been wild early against Toronto and Detroit. He's starting to really settle in, and he, he's given us some good innings. That combination of Pilkington and um, Eli Morgan is almost like it's like a work of art, sort of. If you get Pilkington to throw five, 
and you have Eli Morgan come in to, 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 you know, finish up another two innings or so you're handing us um, an eighth inning with, uh, with, um, wow. Oh, excuse me. Wow. I just had a complete, brain block there but we, you have you have an eighth and nine ninth inning with class a wrapping it up i mean it, it's almost a, a, like pure recipe for success i think he's done a phenomenal job yeah i think if connor pilkington can find some success and at least go four or five innings in that number five spot you know the whole rotation is going to benefit it really helps to have a lefty in your rotation and mm -hmm. you know when savali is healthy we have an all righty rotation which you know it doesn't even force teams to switch their lineup up throughout the course of a series. And I just look like just another gem by this front office in that Cesar Hernandez trade last at the trade deadline last year. Right. Obviously, right. as we know, Hernandez isn't even with the White Sox anymore. Pilkington was a double A when we acquired him. He's already up pitching in the big leagues. And yeah, he's got some nerves and jitters when he goes out there, but he settles down like for being so young like he can really settle in. And you mentioned how Eli Morgan followed him in Detroit and it, it was a perfect combination. And we're starting to see now, like we're about to get into the bullpen and we're starting mm -hmm. to see just how good Eli Morgan has been. And Tito's actually starting to use him in like the eighth inning we saw on yeah. Sunday in Baltimore, Hench just got into some trouble, had a couple guys on base and Eli Morgan came in with one out weak pop-ups, you know, his, what he's been able to do in that bullpen is just outstanding. And that weight he added on that everybody was making fun of in spring training, you know, saying how chubby he looked, he's added like three miles an hour to his fastball. And that was his issue when he was going through lineups multiple times, he didn't have the velo on his fastball mm -hmm. that second time through the order, you know, he couldn't throw the change up as much and he didn't really have anything to play off of that. That was fooling guys, which is why we'd see him get knocked around that second and third time through the lineup. So, I mean, Eli Morgan and the role he's in, especially if he can become that eighth inning guy, seventh, eighth inning guy. I mean, he's, he could be an all-star. Like he, sh he should be, I know only closers really get the looks out of a bullpen typically, but it's incredible. Like what he's been able to do. So I think right. when you have guys like that and De Los Santos, and when you have the bullpen succeeding the way, that it has been for us this season. I think it allows you that flexibility to leave a guy like Pilkington in the rotation and allow him to just kind of grow. And I think we see like Hentges and Morgan were both in the rotation last year, right? When we had all those injuries and I think it's really helped their development and it's allowed them to get that major league experience. So they're able to have success in the roles they're in this year. Yeah. And, and Eli's got that quiet confidence to him right? There, there's not a ton of emotion that he shows. And, and when he comes in, especially this year in that bullpen setting, it, it's just like, it's clockwork for him. He's mowing guys down. And, and on that fastball that you were talking about that he was struggling with last year as a starter, you know, going through the game, you know, those hitters are, are going to recognize it coming out of your hand a little bit more. He's got a 33% whiff rate on the fastball this year, which is fourth best for that pitch specifically in the majors. And in his last 10 appearances since May 1st, 15 innings pitched, four hits, one earned run, a walk, and 20 strikeouts. For and he's <laughs> definitely the most, I think you'd have to put him as the most trusted guy in the bullpen yeah. right now. I know there's class A, he's a closer. We know what we're going to get with him. Yeah, you know his role. Yeah, yeah, but as far as like those bridge guys, mm -hmm. I don't see anybody other than Eli Morgan, like when I see Eli Morgan warming up in the bullpen, I'm like, take a deep breath. Cause I'm like, we're going to be all right. Like we're yeah. going to get it to class a and we're going to be okay. Cause he's just been that solid. Like the dude's not rattled at all. And I think him settling into that role, I think most of us, I know I did kind of expected him to be that extra pitcher while the rosters were expanded. You know, I, that, that deadline to where they allowed the extra pitcher, you know, through June, I think that's helped him because he's been able to show what he's got. Cause if it would have ended back in May, like it was supposed to, he might've been sent down to Columbus so he could start and get stretched out. But like with him leading the way, like, let's take a look at this bullpen. They're fourth in the American league in total bullpen area at 3.01. They're mm -hmm. first in whip at 1.08, which anything one or below is elite. Like they're right bordering elite. They're first in hits allowed with only 115 and they've allowed the second fewest amount of runs at 56. And looking yeah. at those numbers, it's not just one guy. Like 
back in 16, it was like Andrew Miller, Cody Allen. Like you knew the guys who was going to give you success this year. It's all these no name guys who we were all screaming for the front office to sign those veteran proven free agents. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, we're going to hold on to Henches. There's something there. We're going to keep Eli Morgan on the 40 man roster. There's something there. De Los Santos. We're like, who the hell is this? This is our big free agent signing. Like wasn't even a 40 man roster guy, right? These guys have earned their spot there. I guess they, they know something that we don't, right? I mean, yeah. and, and I, I see this happening for years and years to come. We're always going to complain about, you know, the off-season, pre-spring training. What are we doing in the winter, right? I want to see some moves. But look, we're one game under 500. I think if I were to tell you guys that a couple weeks back when we were really in a slump, you, you wouldn't believe it. But we played, excuse me, we played seven less games than the Minnesota Twins. And I believe currently right now, we're only one game off. Um, We're one game behind in the loss column. So there's still a ton of baseball to go, guys. We're not even in July yet. We're just starting June. So there's so many things to be excited about that these guys are just going to get better at day by day. And I said, like, if they can keep it right around 500, Mm -hmm. heading into that series in LA in a couple weeks, it's going to make for a very interesting trade deadline. They're not going to be sellers, you know, they got to figure out some of these 40 man spots because as we know, you got guys like Peyton Battenfield, Bo Naylor, Hunter Gaddis, all these guys tearing up the minors who got to be added to the 40 man this off season. Right. So they got to see what they, what they have in these guys. And, you know, it, it creates interesting questions moving forward. Like guys like Owen Miller, I think they know he's not like a true first baseman moving forward. Is he the utility guy? You know, is Jimenez going to be at second? Gabriel Arias at short. You know, Gabriel Arias is about to return to Columbus. We saw Nolan Jones just get activated um, at Columbus this past week. And I think Nolan Jones is the next guy who's going to make his debut. He's been playing right field um, out in Columbus. Obviously, he had to move off a third base with Jose signing his extension. But these are guys they all still got to get looks to. And guys like Owen Miller... You know, obviously we see he's steadily declined since April because obviously what he was doing in April was superhuman, but it almost makes you wonder when you see these lineup decisions, Andre Jimenez, we'll talk about late in a little bit. He sits against lefties, but he has success against lefties, but Owen Miller plays every single day, no matter what. It yeah. almost makes you feel if it's, if he's in that extended tryout portion mm-hmm. where they're just going to play him every day. They're going to run with him and he's just going to either stick or he's not. Whereas Jimenez, they're kind of trying to protect him a little bit, knowing he's going to have one of those middle infield spots in the future, in the present and in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you, you were talking about not being sellers at the, the trade deadline right now. It's June 8th. We're sitting four games back of Minnesota for the division lead. And we're only one and a half games out of the, um, of the wild card. So keep in mind for all the viewers and listeners, there's three teams this year who claim a wild card spot. And right now we're tied with the Chicago White Sox and we're trailing the Boston Red Sox by a game and a half. We're so, trailing the whole AL East, except yeah. for Baltimore, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's one of the best <laughs> divisions in baseball. There's no doubt about it. But before we move on, you just got to give credit where it's due. You know, we've been talking about this pitching staff as well as the bullpen. But guys like Henches, right? Like he's got an ERA of 1.04 with 21 strikeouts and 17 in the third innings pitch this year. Um, and he's sporting a 0.69 whip. So you were saying anything under one is is elite. And I mean, that is that is all-star type material right there. But then Dilo Santos, he's appeared 12 times and he's My got guy. a 2. 2.08 ERA. Sometimes you'll see him get knocked around a little bit, but it's we keep preaching this. He's a young guy with incredible talent. Just just give him some time, right? He's not a Bobby Bradley. I'm telling you, this guy is actually going to pan out. And then Class A, obviously our guy, he's been phenomenal this year. 10 saves, 2.01 ERA. Got a 0.85 whip with 26 strikeouts and 22 and a third innings pitch. So, I mean, we still have guys on 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 in the bullpen like Stefan Sandlin who were struggling in May. Sean Ghost still have, you know, some some proving to do. But considering all the circumstances when it comes to our ups and downs this season, the rainouts, the double headers, everything thrown our way, the short off season, right? It's been super impressive considering what we thought this bullpen was going to be at the beginning of the season. To, to what it is right now. But, you know, 
we, we can talk about our, our pitching staff all day long like this, but just to, just to recap last week, you know, guardians took two out of three uh, uh, from Baltimore Friday night. They, they took the W six to three with Shane Bieber having a no hitter through the sixth inning. He pitched into the eighth striking out 11 class, a pitch to scoreless nine. And then Owen Miller, the guy you were just talking about drove in four runs, which, which got us to our fourth run in a row. What, what, what did you see, you know, out of that Friday night game that's, you know, sort of in a way started to propel us towards the success. Timely hitting. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's been a theme with this team all year. You know, they talked about it on the broadcast last night. Texas is like, let's just not let them get guys in scoring position and we'll be okay. Right. I think this team just knocks the ball around with, with runners in scoring position. And that's that contact approach. They love it's paying off. Yeah. And then, um, so Saturday's game, you know, we were talking about it earlier. McKenzie had a, a bit of a bump in the road, but the ball was flying out of Camden yards on Saturday. Jimenez and, and, and Rognan or door both hit, um, homers that landed on Utah street, Jose Ramirez and Trey Mancini also homered as well. So it, it was really just more of how many guys did you have on base when you were hitting those nukes? So we were yeah. just on the unlucky end of it. Um, you know, we loaded up the bases in the eighth as the Orioles brought in, um, you know, their closer early. Naylor, unfortunately, flied out to leave the bases loaded and uh, spoiled that rally. But Tristan had his shakiest start of the year, like we were saying earlier. He threw seven innings, gave up five runs on just three hits with four strikeouts and three walks. He's given up eight home runs in his last four starts, so it's something to keep an eye on um, in the future. But I think he's going to be just fine. And then um, Sunday, you know, Guardians bounce back, hold on to that 3-2 win with Plesak on the bump. You know, Jimenez hit a three-run homer in the first that was and, – and, you know, that, that was just basically all she wrote in that one. You know, kind of want to hear what, what your thoughts are, especially, you know, a little bit off topic here. But with Jimenez playing second base, Ahmed Rosario is really starting to heat up at the plate here. Is that, is that what's going to keep him at that shortstop position? <laughs> No, <laughs> he's still a league average bat. Jimenez needs to be at shortstop. He's not going to be at shortstop every day until after the trade deadline when they do something with a med Rosario. And look, when he, he's going to have that game, he's going to go four for five. And then game two, he's, he's swinging off his heels at balls in the other batter's box again. He's just inconsistent. He is who he is. And, you know, last year he was our second best bat and that's how bad our offense was last year that we thought he was a lot better than he was just because we were so bad. Um, but a team is going to really need a league average bat. I mean, I was looking at the all-star ballot today, shortstop in the, in the American league is a struggle this year. Yeah. And I really think a team like the angels, the Phillies, they'll take him in a heartbeat because they're getting absolutely nothing out of their shortstop position right now. And don't think Ahmed Rosario doesn't know all these guys fighting for his job that he's in the yeah. organization that does nothing but draft shortstops. Mm -hmm. um, but Andre Semenis, like I, he needs to be up in the lineup more. Like I would even consider putting him in the two hole right now. Um, I think this season's all about riding the hot hand during that eight game hitting streak. He's hitting 367, three home runs, nine RBIs. He scored six runs. I just don't see a logical reason he shouldn't be playing every single day. Like his numbers don't show that he's a platoon guy. He sits against lefties, but he's hitting 391 against him with a 417 on base percentage. He's right now, he's definitely the second best hitter on this team. And you have to take into consideration the gold glove caliber defense he's playing. But he just continues to show us over and over. He's the shortstop of the present. And Maybe the future. We're so busy talking about guys like Arias and Rocchio. Maybe Jimenez sticks at shortstop and those other guys got to move positions. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think he's a guy that we should see pl playing in L.A. in the All-Star game for sure. Oh, he absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. But, um, you know, we're, we're slowly running out of time here. Um, so I could quickly just wanted to recap yesterday's doubleheader. Um, so after we won game one, six to three. Um, so that was our seventh win out of our last nine games. As I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, we won seven out of our last 10. But Cal, Cal Quantrill, seven innings strong, three runs, eight hits, struck out three and walked only one. Um, gave up two home runs in the seventh to rookie Steel Walker. I think it was his first major league hit. So congrats to that kid. Obviously, you know, I mean, we, we got out with the win, so so I can be happy for him. But Marcus Simeon, 
was tearing us up yesterday. And thankfully we were able to get game one, but game two with, uh, with McCarty starting, making uh, his, his debut for the team kind of just, kind, kind of just didn't have it. You know, it, it was a long day for, for both teams, but you know, Texas obviously came out a little bit stronger in, in game two. It was sort of like we switched roles, you know, game one, we were in full control game two. It was what five, nothing at one point. It was, it sort of just slipped away. Yeah, it's just this doubleheader was just the epitome of what this team's been all year. They're a young team. They're up and down. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I really wish they could get a better guy for spot starts in these doubleheaders. You know, Kirk McCarty should have never faced um, Texas the second time through the lineup. They're a slugging team. Mm -hmm. Marcus Simeon was playing out of his mind. Right. Um, he, He just should have never been out there. He's not a legit prospect. That's fine. The only other guy, I think, on the 40... Cody Morris is uh, on the injured list, but there's Tobias Myers who's struggling at Columbus. So McCarty was really the only guy they could go to, but it should have been a true bullpen game then, you know, pitch him a couple innings, bring the next guy in, but it gave him the opportunity to pitch the guys who were struggling, right? Sandlin, Stefan, Ghost, Shaw, they all got to get in, get some reps and try to work through some things. And Sandlin didn't walk anybody, even though his first pitch went to the backstop. So, hey, Shaw Shaw got out of a jam as well. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> another thing from this game, Oscar Gonzalez still on yep, fire. I, I don't know say. that two run single he had. He the league's adjusting to him. They know he swings and pitches low and away. He mm-hmm. swung at one to make it 0-2 and he was shaking his head. He was so mad right. at himself. He adjusted. He got the two, the two out, two strike, two RBI single. And that's such a good sign. I don't think people understand how susceptible this kid is to that, that pitch low and away. And he adjusted yeah. and you love to see it. And I think in game one earlier on that day, he, he smoked the ball to left field and the, the left fielder was going in and then quickly realized like, Oh God, that's over my head. Like this, he this it. kid absolutely rocks the baseball. And, and I'm telling you like Marcus Simeon had a good day, but Oscar Gonzalez is having a good month, right? We're I'm glad he's playing in. every day. Right. I'm really I, glad. I'm glad to see it, right? There's something about these Cleveland rookies this year. Quan um, and Palacios. Palacios even had some contributions last night as well, but then to have Oscar Gonzalez put put the, the cherry on top is just, just really nice to see. Um, but just to just to wrap up what, what's coming up this week, we're, we're opening uh, – so tonight, Shane Bieber's facing off against Dane Dunning, um, and hopefully we get that game in. Like we were saying, there, there is a lot of rain in the forecast. We're just going to see how, how it plays out. Texas does not return to Cleveland this year, so it almost seems as if we're going to have to play it because we have a game tomorrow. We can't just push it off. So we're opening up a four-game weekend series with Oakland at home um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? We got Connor Pilkington. Um, you know, leading it off on Thursday, Tristan McKenzie, hopefully going to have a bounce back performance on Friday night, Saturday, Zach Plesak versus Frankie Montas. So, you know, Montas has had some success in his career against the guardians. Um, he's having a bit of an up and down year two and six with 3.06 ERA. I think that's the game to watch. That's going to be a really, you know, sort of like a, a, a slugging match. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that one goes. But Sunday's game, un, unusual early start, 11.35 a.m. We got Cal Quantrill going up against Cole Irvin. So just, Get your just, Peacock free trials. The game's on Peacock. Yeah. A stupid Ho- MLB thing. Only they could make games less accessible oh, to the God. fans they have left. Yeah. Well, Get your I free mean, trials going. <laughs> a little frustrating, a little frustrating. But um, Mel, I wanted to pass it off to you. We got a couple injury updates here. Um, before we wrap it up. So, you know, let us know about Aaron Savali and from Noah Reyes. Yeah. So Aaron Savali threw a side session on Monday. He did pitcher fielding practice yesterday and he's going to throw, according to Mandy Bell, he's going to throw three innings for Columbus tomorrow night at Indianapolis. Um, and Fran Mel Reyes has been out since May 26 with that hamstring. They're working on kind of not just getting him off the IL, but setting him up for success when he does return. He took batting practice out there. Um, this series against Texas and the team's going to meet with him Friday to kind of figure out where to go from here. And speaking of Columbus, we mentioned Nolan Jones earlier. He could be the next guy to make his major league debut. He reached base five times today for Columbus. He was three for three with three RBIs and two walks. Love his hitting profile. Dude's got power. Dude walks a ton. He gets on base and I'm super excited to see him out in the outfield, hopefully here within the next month. 
Um, and before we wrap it up, make sure you guys are going online and voting for the all-star game balloting. The ballots open today. Make sure you're voting Andre Semenes, Jose Ramirez. It's neck and neck with Jose and Devers from what I'm seeing so far. And it's amazing how few people know about Jimenez outside of Cleveland. So let's change that. Let's get these guys some national attention, but let's go guardians. Let's hope we get this game in here tonight and uh, stay safe, stay healthy. And we will see you next week.